The Epic of Gilgamesh, an epic poem from Mesopotamia, is amongst the earliest surviving works of literature. The literary history of Gilgamesh begins with five independent Sumerian poems about Gilgamesh, Sumerian for Gilgamesh, King of Uruk. Four of these were used as source material for a combined epic in Akkadian. This first combined epic, known as the Old Babylonian Version, dates to the 18th century BC and is titled after its incipit, Shtur Elishar, surpassing all other kings. Only a few fragments of it have survived. The later standard Babylonian version dates from the 13th to the 10th centuries BC and bears the incipit Shunakba Muru, he who saw the deep in modern terms, he who sees the unknown. Fragments of approximately two-thirds of this longer, 12 tablet version have been recovered. Some of the best copies were discovered in the library ruins of the 7th century BC Assyrian king Ashurbanipal. The first half of the story relates a friendship between Gilgamesh, king of Uruk, and Enkidu. Enkidu is a wild man created by the gods as Gilgamesh's peer to distract him from oppressing the people of Uruk. Together, they journey to the Cedar Mountain to defeat Humbada, its monstrous guardian. Later they kill the Bull of Heaven, which the god Asishtar sends to punish Gilgamesh for spurning her advances. As a punishment for these actions, the god sentences Enkidu to death. In the second half of the epic, Gilgamesh's distress at Enkidu's death causes him to undertake a long and perilous journey to discover the secret of eternal life. He eventually learns that life, which you look for, you will never find. For when the gods created man, they let death be his share, and life withheld in their own hands. However, because of his great building projects, his account of Sidere's advice, and what the immortal man Utnapishtim told him about the great flood, Gilgamesh's fame survived his death. His story has been translated into many languages, and in recent years has featured in works of popular fiction. The Deluge Tablet of the Gilgamesh Epic in Akkadian Many distinct sources exist from over a 2,000-year time frame. The old Sumerian poems, followed by a later Akkadian version, are important sources for modern translations, with the Sumerian version mainly used to fill in lacunae in the Akkadian version. Although several revised versions based on new discoveries have been published, the epic remains incomplete. The earliest Sumerian poems are now generally considered to be distinct stories, rather than parts of a single epic. 45 they date from as early as the 3rd dynasty of Ur, 2150-2000 BC. 4142 The earliest Akkadian versions are dated to the early 2nd millennium, 45 most probably in the 18th or 17th century BC, when one or more authors drew upon existing literary material to create a single epic. The standard Akkadian version, consisting of 12 tablets, was edited by Senelli Qianini sometime between 1300 and 1000 BC, and was found in the library of Ashurbanipal in Nineveh. The Epic of Gilgamesh was discovered by Hormuz Drasam in 1853, and is now widely known. The central character of Gilgamesh was initially reintroduced to the world as Isdubur, before the cuneiform logographs and his name could be pronounced accurately. The first modern translation was published in the early 1870s, by George Smith. Recent translations into English include one undertaken with the assistance of the American novelist John Gardner and John Mayer, published in 1984. In 2001, Benjamin Foster produced a translation in the Norton Critical Edition series that uses new material to fill in many of the blanks in previous editions. The most definitive translation is a two-volume critical work by Andrew George. George discusses the state of the surviving material and provides a tablet-by-tablet -tablet exegesis with a dual-language side-by-side translation. This translation was published by Oxford University Press in 2003. Stephen Mitchell in 2004 supplied a controversial translation that takes many liberties with the text and includes modernized allusions and commentary relating to the Iraq War of 2003. The first direct Arabic translation from the original tablets was made in the 1960s by the Iraqi archaeologist Taha Bakir.
the discovery of artifacts, ca. 2600 BC, associated with Enmabar Jaisi of Kish, mentioned in the legends as the father of one of Gilgamesh's adversaries, has lent credibility to the historical existence of Gilgamesh. 4041. Versions of the Epic from the diverse sources found two main versions of the epic have been partially reconstructed, the standard Akkadian version, or he, who saw the deep, and the old Babylonian version, or surpassing all other kings. Five earlier Sumerian poems about Gilgamesh have been partially recovered, some with primitive versions of specific episodes, in the Akkadian version, others with unrelated stories. Standard Akkadian Version the standard version was discovered by Hormuz Drasam in the library of Ashurbanipal in Nineveh in 1853. It was written in standard Babylonian, a dialect of Akkadian, that was used for literary purposes. This version was compiled by Senelikuianini sometime between 1300 and 1000 BC from earlier material. The standard version and earlier version have different opening words or incipit. The older version begins with the word surpassing all other kings, while the standard version has he, who saw the deep in Agba Amuru, deep referring to the mysteries of the information brought back by Gilgamesh from his meeting with Utanapishti, Utnapishtim, about Ea, the fountain of wisdom. Gilgamesh was given knowledge of how to worship the gods, why death was ordained for human beings, what makes a good king, and how to live a good life. The story of Utnapishtim, the hero of the flood myth, can also be found in the Babylonian epic of Atrahasis. The twelfth tablet is a sequel to the original eleven, and was probably added at a later date. It bears little relation to the well-crafted eleven tablet epic, the lines at the beginning of the first tablet are quoted at the end of the eleventh tablet, giving it circularity and finality. Tablet 12 is near copy of an earlier Sumerian tale, a prequel, in which Gilgamesh sends Enkidu to retrieve some objects of his from the underworld, and he returns in the form of a spirit to relate the nature of the underworld to Gilgamesh. Content of the Standard Version Tablets Tablet 1 The story introduces Gilgamesh, King of Uruk. Gilgamesh, two-thirds god and one-third man is oppressing his people who cry out to the gods for help. For the young women of Uruk this oppression takes the form of a droid desainer or lord's right to sleep with brides on their wedding night. For the young men, the tablet is damaged at this point, it is conjectured that Gilgamesh exhausts them through games, tests of strength, or perhaps forced labor on building projects. The gods respond to the people's pleas by creating an equal to Gilgamesh who will be able to distract him. This is the primitive man, Enkeju, who is covered in hair and lives in the wild with the animals. He is spotted by a trapper, whose livelihood is being ruined because Enkeju is uprooting his traps. The trapper tells Gilgamesh about the man, and it is arranged for Enkeju to be seduced by Shamhat, a temple prostitute, his first step towards being tamed, and after seven days of lovemaking, she takes him back to Uruk. Gilgamesh, meanwhile, has been having dreams about the imminent arrival of a beloved new companion. Tablet 2 Shamhat brings Enkidu to a shepherd's camp, where he is introduced to a human diet, and becomes the night watchman. Learning from a passing stranger about Gilgamesh's treatment of new brides, Enkidu is incensed and travels to Uruk to intervene at a wedding. When Gilgamesh attempts to visit the wedding chamber, Enkidu blocks his way, and they fight. After a fierce battle, Enkidu acknowledges Gilgamesh's superior strength, and they become friends. Gilgamesh proposes a journey to the cedar forest to slay the monstrous demigod Humbaba in order to gain fame and renown. Despite warnings from Enkidu and the Council of Elders, Gilgamesh will not be deterred. Tablet 3 the elders give Gilgamesh advice for his journey. Gilgamesh visits his mother, the goddess Ninsun, who seeks the support and protection of the sun god Shamash for their adventure. Ninsun adopts Enkidu as her son, and Gilgamesh leaves instructions for the governance of Uruk in his absence. Tablet 4 Gilgamesh and Enkidu journey to the cedar forest. Every few days they camp on a mountain and perform a dream ritual. 
Gilgamesh has five terrifying dreams about falling mountains, thunderstorms, wild bulls, and a thunderbird that breathes fire. Despite similarities between his dream figures and earlier descriptions of Humbada, Ankaju interprets these dreams as good omens and denies that the frightening images represent the forest guardian. As they approach the cedar mountain, they hear Humbada bellowing and have to encourage each other not to be afraid. Tablet 5 The Heroes Enter the Cedar Forest Humbada, the ogre guardian of the cedar forest, insults and threatens them. He accuses Enkaju of betrayal and vows to disembowel Gilgamesh and feed his flesh to the birds. Gilgamesh is afraid, but with some encouraging words from Enkaju the battle commences. The mountains quake with the tumult and the sky turns black. The god Shamash sends thirteen winds to bind Hambada and he is captured. The monster pleads for his life and Gilgamesh pities him. Enkaju, however, is enraged and asks Gilgamesh to kill the beast. Humbada curses them both and Gilgamesh dispatches him with a blow to the neck. The two heroes cut down many cedars, including a gigantic tree that Enkaju plans to fashion into a gate for the temple of Enlil. They build a raft and return home, along the Euphrates, with a giant tree and the head of Humbada. Tablet 6 Gilgamesh rejects the advances of the goddess Ishtar because of her mistreatment of previous lovers like Damuzi. Ishtar asks her father Anu to send Gugulana the Bull of Heaven to avenge her. When Anu rejects her complaints, Ishtar threatens to raise the dead who will outnumber the living and devour them. Anu becomes frightened and gives in to her. Ishtar leads the Bull of Heaven to Uruk and it causes widespread devastation. It lowers the level of the Euphrates River and dries up the marshes. It opens up huge pits that swallow 300 men. Without any divine assistance, Enkaju and Gilgamesh attack and slay it and offer up its heart to Shamash. When Ishtar cries out, Enkaju hurls one of the hindquarters of the bull at her. The city of Uruk celebrates, but Enkaju has an ominous dream. Tablet 7 in Enkaju's dream, the gods decide that one of the heroes must die, because they killed Humbada and the Bull of Heaven. Despite the protestations of Shamash, Enkaju is marked for death. Enkaju curses the great door he has fashioned for Enlil's temple. He also curses the trapper and Shamhat for removing him from the wild. Shamash reminds Enkaju of how Shamhat fed and clothed him and introduced him to Gilgamesh. Shamash tells him that Gilgamesh will bestow great honors upon him at his funeral and will wander into the wild consumed with grief. Enkaju regrets his curses and blesses Shamhat. In a second dream however he sees himself being taken captive to the netherworld by a terrifying angel of death. The underworld is a house of dust and darkness whose inhabitants eat clay and are clothed in bird feathers supervised by terrifying beings. For twelve days, Enkaju's condition worsens. Finally, after a lament that he could not meet a heroic death in battle, he dies. Tablet 8 Gilgamesh delivers a lamentation for Enkaju, in which he calls upon mountains, forests, fields, rivers, wild animals, and all of Uruk to mourn for his friend. Recalling their adventures together, Gilgamesh tears at his hair and clothes in grief. He commissions a funerary statue and provides grave gifts from his treasury to ensure that Enkaju has a favorable reception in the realm of the dead. A great banquet is held where the treasures are offered to the gods of the netherworld. Just before a break in the text there is a suggestion that a river is being dammed, indicating a burial in a riverbed, as in the corresponding Sumerian poem The Death of Gilgamesh. Tablet 9 Tablet 9 opens with Gilgamesh roaming the wild wearing animal skins, grieving for Enkaju. Fearful of his own death, he decides to set Utnapishtim, the far away, and learn the secret of eternal life. Among the few survivors of the Great Flood, Utnapishtim and his wife are the only humans to have been granted immortality by the gods. Gilgamesh crosses a mountain pass at night and encounters a pride of lions. Before sleeping he prays for protection to the moon god Sin. Then, waking from an encouraging dream, he kills the lions and uses their skins for clothing. 
After a long and perilous journey, Gilgamesh arrives at the Twin Peaks of Mount Meshu, at the end of the earth. He comes across a tunnel which no man has ever entered, guarded by two terrible scorpion men. After questioning him and recognizing his semi-divine nature, they allow him to enter it, and he passes under the mountains along the road. Of the Sunday in complete darkness he follows the road for twelve double hours managing to complete the trip, before the sun catches up with him. He arrives at the Garden of the Gods, a paradise full of jewel-laden trees. Tablet 10 Meeting the alewife Siduri, who assumes, because of his disheveled appearance, that he is a murderer or thief, Gilgamesh tells her about the purpose of his journey. She attempts to dissuade him from his quest, but sends him to Urshanabi the ferryman, who will help him cross the sea to Utnapishtim. Gilgamesh, out of spontaneous rage, destroys the stone giants that live with Urshanabi. He tells him his story, but when he asks for his help, Urshanabi informs him that he has just destroyed the only creatures who can cross the waters of death, which are deadly to the touch. Urshanabi instructs Gilgamesh to cut down 120 trees and fashion them into punting poles. When they reach the island where Utnapishtim lives, Gilgamesh recounts his story asking him for his help. Utnapishtim reprimands him, declaring that fighting the common fate of humans is futile and diminishes life's joys. Tablet 11. Gilgamesh observes that Utnapishtim seems no different from himself, and asks him how he obtained his immortality. Utnapishtim explains that the gods decided to send a great flood. To save Utnapishtim the god Dia told him to build a boat. He gave him precise dimensions, and it was sealed with pitch and bitumen. His entire family went aboard together with his craftsmen and all the animals of the field. A violent storm then arose which caused the terrified gods to retreat to the heavens. Ishtar lamented the wholesale destruction of humanity, and the other gods wept beside her. The storm lasted six days and nights, after which all the human beings turned to clay. Utnapishtim weeps when he sees the destruction. His boat lodges on a mountain, and he releases a dove, a swallow, and a raven. When the raven fails to return, he opens the ark and frees its inhabitants. Utnapishtim offers a sacrifice to the gods, who smell the sweet savor, and gather around. Ishtar vows that just, as she will never forget the brilliant necklace, that hangs around her neck, she will always remember this time. When Enlil arrives, angry that there are survivors, she condemns him for instigating the flood. Ea also castigates him for sending a disproportionate punishment. And Lil blesses Utnapishtim and his wife and rewards them with eternal life. This account matches the flood story that concludes the epic of Atrahasis. See also Gilgamesh flood myth. The main point seems to be that when Enlil granted eternal life, it was a unique gift. As if to demonstrate this point, Utnapishtim challenges Gilgamesh to stay awake for six days and seven nights. Gilgamesh falls asleep and Utnapishtim instructs his wife to bake a loaf of bread on each of the days he is asleep, so that he cannot deny his failure to keep awake. Gilgamesh, who is seeking to overcome death, cannot even conquer sleep. After instructing Urshanabi the ferryman to wash Gilgamesh and clothe him in royal robes, they depart for Uruk. As they are leaving, Utnapishtim's wife asks her husband to offer a parting gift. Utnapishtim tells Gilgamesh that at the bottom of the sea there lives a box thorn, like plant, that will make him young again. Gilgamesh, by binding stones to his feet, so he can walk on the bottom, manages to obtain the plant. He intends to test it on an old man, when he returns to Uruk. Unfortunately, when Gilgamesh stops to bathe, it is stolen by a serpent, who sheds its skin, as it departs. Gilgamesh weeps at the futility of his efforts, because he has now lost all chance of immortality. He returns to Uruk, where the sight of its massive walls prompts him to praise the centering work to Urshanabi. Tablet 12 This tablet is mainly an Akkadian translation of an earlier Sumerian poem, Gilgamesh and the Netherworld, also known as Gilgamesh and Keju and the netherworld and variants, although it has been suggested that it is derived from an unknown version of that story. 
42 The of this last tablet are inconsistent with previous ones, and Kaju is still alive, despite having died earlier in the epic. Because of this, its lack of integration with the other tablets, and the fact that it is almost a copy of an earlier version, it has been referred to as an, an organic appendage to the epic. Alternatively, it has been suggested that its purpose, though crudely handled, is to explain to Gilgamesh and the reader the various fates of the dead in the afterlife, and in an awkward attempt to bring closure it both connects the Gilgamesh of the epic with the Gilgamesh who is the king of the netherworld, and is a dramatic capstone whereby the twelve tablet epic ends on one, and the same theme, that of seeing equals understanding, discovery, etc., with which it began. Gilgamesh complains to Enkidu that various of his possessions, the tablet is unclear exactly what different translations include a drum and a ball, have fallen into the underworld. Enkidu offers to bring them back. Delighted, Gilgamesh tells Enkidu what he must and must not do in the underworld if he is to return. Enkidu does everything which he was told not to do. The underworld keeps him. Gilgamesh prays to the gods to give him back his friend. And Lil and Sue and don't reply, but EA and Shamash decide to help. Shamash makes a crack in the earth, and Enkaju's ghost jumps out of it. The tablet ends with Gilgamesh questioning Enkaju about what he has seen in the underworld. Old Babylonian versions. This version of the epic, called in some fragments surpassing all other kings, is composed of tablets and fragments from diverse origins and states of conservation. It remains incomplete in its majority, with several tablets missing and big lacunae in those found. They are named after their current location, or the place where they were found. Pennsylvania Tablet Surpassing all other kings tablet 2. Greatly correlates with tablet side 2 of the standard version. Gilgamesh tells his mother Ninzun about two dreams he had. His mother explains that they mean that a new companion will soon arrive at Uruk. In the meanwhile the wild Enkaju and the priestess, here called Shamkadam, are making love. She tames him in company of the shepherds by offering him bread and beer. Enkaju helps the shepherds by guarding the sheep. They travel to Uruk to confront Gilgamesh and stop his abuses. Enkaju and Gilgamesh battle but Gilgamesh breaks off the fight. Enkaju praises Gilgamesh. Yell Tablet Surpassing all other kings tablet 3, partially matches tablet Psi 3 of the standard version. For reasons unknown, the tablet is partially broken, and Kaju is in a sad mood. In order to cheer him up Gilgamesh suggests going to the pine forest to cut down trees and kill Humbada, known here as Hawawa. And Kaju protests, as he knows Hawawa and is aware of his power. Gilgamesh talks Enkaju into it with some words of encouragement, but Enkaju remains reluctant. They prepare and call for the elders. The elders also protest, but after Gilgamesh talks to them, they agree to let him go. After Gilgamesh asks his god, Shamash, for protection, and both equip, they leave with the elders' blessing and counsel. Philadelphia Fragment Possibly another version of the other Yale tablet. Practically irrecoverable. Nipple or school tablet. In the journey to the cedar forest and Hawawa, Enkaju interprets one of Gilgamesh's dreams. Tell Harmel tablets. Fragments from two different versions slash tablets tell how Enkaju interprets one of Gilgamesh's dreams on the way to the forest of cedar and their conversation when entering the forest. Ischeli tablet. After defeating Hawawa, Gilgamesh refrains from slaying him and urges Enkaju to hunt Hawawa's seven oars. Enkaju convinces him to smite their enemy. After killing Hawawa and the oars, they chop down part of the forest and discover the god's secret abode. The rest of the tablet is broken. The oars are not referred to in the standard version, but are in one of the Sumerian poems. Partial Fragment in Baghdad Partially overlapping the felling of the trees from the Ishchali tablet. Sippert tablet. Partially overlapping the standard version tablet Cyxx. Gilgamesh mourns the death of Enkaju wandering in his quest for immortality. Gilgamesh argues with Shamash about the futility of his quest. 
After a lacuna, Gilgamesh talks to Siduri about his quest and his journey to meet Tutnapishtim, here called Utanaishtim. Siduri attempts to dissuade Gilgamesh in his quest for immortality, urging him to be content with the simple pleasures of life, Gilgamesh, with her are you wandering? Life, which you look for, you will never find. For when the gods created man, they let death be his share, and life withheld in their own hands. Gilgamesh, fill your belly. Day and night make merry. Let days be full of joy, dance, and make music day and night. And wear fresh clothes. And wash your head and bathe. Look at the child that is holding your hand, and let your wife delight in your embrace. These things alone are the concern of men. After one more lacuna, Gilgamesh smashes the stone creatures and talks to the ferryman Urshanabi, here called Sir Sunabu. After a short discussion, Sir Sunabu asks him to carve three hundred doors so that they may cross the waters of death without needing the stone ones. The rest of the tablet is missing. The text on the old Babylonian Meissner fragment, the larger surviving fragment of the Sippar tablet, has been used to reconstruct possible earlier forms of the Epic of Gilgamesh, and it has been suggested that a prior form of the story, earlier even than that preserved on the old Babylonian fragment, may well have ended with Sidiri sending Gilgamesh back to Uruk, and Utnapistim was not originally part of the tale. Sumerian Poems There are five extant Gilgamesh stories in the form of older poems in Sumerian. These probably circulated independently, rather than being in the form of a unified epic. Some of the names of the main characters in these poems differ slightly from later Arcadian names, e.g. Gilgamesh is written for Gilgamesh, and there are some differences in the underlying stories, e.g. in the Sumerian version in Kaju is Gilgamesh's servant. 1. Backquote the Lord to the Living Owns Mountain Backquote Han Backquote Ho Harabakwot correspond to the Cedar Forest episode, Standard Version Tablets 2v, Gilgamesh, and Inkaju travel with other men to the forest of Cedar. There, trapped by Harawa, Gilgamesh tricks him, with Inkaju's assistance, in one of the versions, into giving up his auras, thus losing his power. 2. Backquote Hero in Battle Backquote corresponds to the Bull of Heaven episode, Standard Version Tablet B.I., in the Akkadian version. The bull's voracious appetite causes drought and hardship in the land, while Gilgamesh feasts. Lugalbanda convinces him to face the beast, and fights it alongside Enkaju. 3. Backquote The Envoys of Akka has no corresponding episode in the epic, but the themes of whether to show mercy to captives and counsel from the city elders also occur in the standard version of the Humbaba story. In the poem, Uruk faces a siege from a Kasharmi led by King Akka, whom Gilgamesh defeats and forgives. 4. Backquote In those days, in those far-off days backquote is the source for the Akkadian translation included as Tablet 12 in the Standard Version, telling of Inkaju's journey to the netherworld. 5. Backquote The Great Wild Bull is Lying Down Backquote, a poem about Bill Game's death, burial, and consecration, as a semi-god, reigning and giving judgment over the dead. After dreaming of how the gods decide his fate after death, Gilgamesh takes counsel, prepares his funeral, and offers gifts to the gods. Once deceased, he is buried under the Euphrates, taken off its course, and later returned to it. Relationship to the Bible Further information, Bambobilinism Various themes, plot elements, and characters in the Epic of Gilgamesh have counterparts in the Book of Genesis, notably the accounts of the Garden of Eden and Noah's Flood. The parallels between the stories of Inkaju slash Shamhat and Adam slash Eve have been long recognized by scholars. In both, a man is created from the soil by a god, and lives in a natural setting, amongst the animals. He is introduced to a woman, who tempts him. In both stories the man accepts food from the woman, covers his nakedness, and must leave his former realm, unable to return. The presence of a snake that steals a plant of immortality from the hero later in the epic is another point of similarity. And Roar George submits that the flood myth in Genesis 6-8 matches that in Gilgamesh so closely that few doubt that it derives from a Mesopotamian account.
What is particularly noticeable is the way the Genesis Flood story follows the Gilgamesh Flood tale point by point, and in the same order even when the story permits other alternatives. In a 2001 Dora commentary released on behalf of the conservative movement of Judaism, rabbinic scholar Robert Wexler stated, The most likely assumption we can make is that both Genesis and Gilgamesh drew their material from a common tradition about the flood that existed in Mesopotamia. These stories then diverged in the retelling. Other Parallels Matthias Henze suggests that Nebuchadnezzar's madness in the biblical book of Daniel draws on the epic of Gilgamesh. He claims that the author uses elements from the description of Enkidu to paint a sarcastic and mocking portrait of the king of Babylon. Many scholars note an influence on the book of Ecclesiastes. The speech of Sidhari in an old Babylonian version of the epic is so similar to Ecclesiastes 9.7.10 that direct influence is a possibility. A rare proverb about the strength of a triple-stranded rope is common to both books. Influence on Homer Numerous scholars have drawn attention to various themes, episodes, and verses that indicate a substantial influence of the Epic of Gilgamesh on both of the epic poems ascribed to Homer. These influences are detailed by Martin Litchfield West in the East Face of Helicon, West Asiatic Elements in Greek Poetry and Myth. According to Tsviabush of Brandeis University, the poem combines the power and tragedy of the Iliad with the wanderings and marvels of the Odyssey. It is a work of adventure, but is no less a meditation on some fundamental issues of human existence. In Popular Culture Gilgamesh in Popular Culture The Epic of Gilgamesh has inspired many works of literature, art, music, as Theodol Rzeolkowski points out in his book Gilgamesh Among Us, Modern Encounters with the Ancient Epic, 2011. It was only after the First World War that the Gilgamesh epic reached a wide audience, and only after the Second World War, that it began to feature in a variety of genres. 